Welcome to our final lecture of Module 3, climate, our Climate Change Module, Lecture 3.5. In this particular lecture, we're actually going to be looking at two different concepts. What is a greenhouse gas and how humans are actually contributing to climate change, the behaviors that we are engaging in that are enhancing climate change. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to identify which gases in our atmosphere are greenhouse gases. Uh, you should also be able to explain this concept of global warming potential and why some greenhouse gases are more potent uh, and contribute more to climate change than others. And then finally be able to identify the primary sources of human-induced climate change. What behaviors are we engaging in as humans that are primarily contributing towards enhanced climate change? With that in mind, there are two primary key terms for you to be aware of and um, be ready to um, be quizzed on, and that is greenhouse gases, obviously, and global warming potential. So what are greenhouse gases? Well, the Earth's atmosphere, as we learned last class, our last lecture is composed of a variety of gases, most of which are not greenhouse gases. In fact, 99% of the gases in our atmosphere are not greenhouse gases. The bulk of our atmosphere is nitrogen, um, and then the second largest percentage of our atmosphere is oxygen. And then we have a bunch of other gases that are not greenhouse gases, and then this tiny little 1% that's causing all the problems uh, are greenhouse gases. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that um, water or water vapor is actually the most abundant greenhouse gas in our atmosphere. Um, we hear a lot about carbon dioxide and we hear a lot about methane as being important greenhouse gases and of course they are, um, but percentage wise they take up much less of our atmosphere than water vapor does. Um, water is uh, actually what keeps Earth's temperature relatively constant in, compared to um, Venus or Mars or whatever um, other planets that have really extreme cold and really hot temperatures. So it's a very key greenhouse gas. It's not very potent in that it doesn't absorb and hold on to heat energy the same way that carbon dioxide and methane do. So that's why we hear about it less in the context of um, greenhouse, the greenhouse effect and climate change. So here we have a slide with greenhouse gases versus non-greenhouse gases. These are all gases that are in our atmosphere that can be found in various different layers of our atmosphere. Um, and we've talked already a little bit about these, but you can see um, water, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, CFCs and other um, man-made gases um, like PFCs, things like that, are also greenhouse gases, and then sulfur hexafluoride. So those are the those are what are greenhouse gases. When we're talking about climate change, we most often focus on carbon dioxide and then methane. However, um, that's not to say that these other gases aren't also contributing to climate change. So the reason why we actually focus on carbon dioxide the most and methane is because not all greenhouse gases have the same impact on global warming. Some greenhouse gases affect climate change to a greater degree than others and carbon dioxide is one of those gases. So why is that? Well, the impact that a gas is going to have on climate change and global warming is the result of two things. The global warming potential of a gas and how concentrated it is in the atmosphere. That combined determine the impact that that gas is going to have on global warming. So let's look at carbon dioxide first. Carbon dioxide is a potent greenhouse gas 
for one primary reason. It stays in the atmosphere for a very long time. So once it's emitted, it can stay in our atmosphere for thousands and thousands of years. A large percentage of our carbon dioxide is actually dissolved into our ocean, and that happens over a period of 20 to 200 years. So in the grand scheme of things, relatively quickly. We've learned in previous lectures that this amount of carbon dioxide that's being dissolved into the ocean is a problem for our oceans. It's turning our ocean um, into become more acidic and it's causing problems for aquatic life in our oceans. Um, anything that's not absorbed by our ocean stays in our atmosphere, stays in um, various different layers. And as a result, it becomes more and more concentrated in our atmosphere. So that's why it is the greenhouse gas, gas that's most commonly discussed. Um, most of the other gases that are greenhouse gases will disappear quicker. They'll dissipate, they'll um, get absorbed, they will um, become less and less concentrated to the point where they don't exist. Um, but because carbon dioxide does not do that, um, and because it takes thousands of years to be removed, we keep adding more without the, the stuff that was already there being removed. Um, so that is why we talk about carbon dioxide the most, um, is because it affects our climate for thousands of years. And something I want to point out here, if we were to stop emitting any more carbon dioxide into our atmosphere immediately right now, we would still see the effects of climate change for many years into the future because the carbon that is currently in the atmosphere is going to stay there and it's going to continue to affect us for years and decades, perhaps centuries to come. So um, that's why this is an, a problem that is urgent and needs to be dealt with. Okay, so even though carbon dioxide is a major contributor to global warming, there are all of these other gases like methane and nitrous oxide, CFCs, ozone, water vapor that are at play and are affecting our climate and are changing our climate. So this here is a short little video that explores these other gases and their impact on global warming. So take a minute to pause the slideshow, watch the video, learn about these gases, and then um, come back. All right. So you learned a little bit about water vapor and the role that it has. You learned about um, nitrous oxide. You learned about methane. Um, methane, as you learned about, is an off gas produced by decaying organic matter, such as um, animal waste, um, decomposing things in landfills, and the decomposing, um, like in wetlands, all that decomposing matter, and in rice paddies. It's actually a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, um, but in, in terms of how, um, how much of the Earth's, of the sun's energy it can absorb, it absorbs more than carbon dioxide, so it has the potential to warm the Earth quicker. However, it doesn't because there's much less methane than carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, and it resides in our atmosphere for a much shorter time than carbon dioxide. So when we release methane, it stays in the atmosphere much briefer than carbon dioxide does. So, um, you know, I talked about it being in the uh, carbon dioxide potentially being in the atmosphere for thousands of years. Methane, by contrast, is, is removed from the atmosphere through various different chemical reactions. And in about 12 years, the methane is removed. Um, so though it's potent, its effect is relatively short-lived, so we can eliminate it from our atmosphere quicker. Um, however, as a sort of related note, scientists are becoming more and more concerned about increasing levels of methane in our atmosphere um, and uh, potentially a positive feedback mechanism occurring. Um, what we're seeing happen in our Arctic regions of the world is um, ground is thawing. Ground that's never been thawed before is thawing uh, due to warmer temperatures. 
this um, gr this land ground called permafrost is thawing. As it thaws, it releases methane into our atmosphere. There's methane trapped in that permafrost. And as long as that permafrost is frozen, that methane stays there. But as soon as it thaws, it's released. Um, and so scientists are concerned that as more and more of our permafrost thaws, we are going to see larger volumes of methane released into our atmosphere. Okay, so we've, we've been talking about what is global warming potential. Um, global warming potential is actually a, a measurement. It's a number that's assigned to greenhouse gases. And it is um, a number that is compare, in comparison to carbon dioxide. So it's the definition is the amount of warming that a gas will cause in the next 100 years compared to the same volume of carbon dioxide. So this um, graphic sort of looks at what, what is the global warming potential of a pound of methane, how much carbon dioxide would you need to warm the earth the same amount as a pound of methane. And you can see that it's a ratio of 1 to 21. So this puts the global warming potential of methane at 21 in comparison to carbon dioxide. Um, and so the larger the number of the global warming potential, the less potent that um, greenhouse gas is. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so what this basically means is in the next 100 years, one pound of methane will have the same global warming effect as approximately 21 pounds of carbon dioxide. So it takes less, sorry, less methane than carbon dioxide to heat the earth the same amount. However, the methane is going to dissipate and disappear much faster than the carbon dioxide. So although methane is more potent, carbon dioxide lasts longer. So that's the global warming potential. Global warming potential is the length it lasts in the atmosphere plus how the strength of its infrared absorption. We're not going to focus on infrared absorption in this class. It's, um, it's beyond the level of um, techno technicalness that we need. Um, but just know that some greenhouse gases absorb more of the sun's energy than others. And obviously, if you absorb more, you hold on to that heat more, you retain it more, um, and it's going to heat the earth more. So that's basically um, what this slide says here. Global warming potential of a gas depends on how much of that infrared light from the sun is absorbed by the chemical and how long the chemical stays in the atmosphere. Scientifically speaking, how long it stays in the atmosphere is referred to as its residence time. Carbon dioxide has a long residence time. Car uh, methane has a short residence time. You can see here sort of that divided out by the type of um, different types of um, greenhouse gases. On the left-hand column, you have the um, primary greenhouse gases that we have and you can see their global warming potential. And it's all in relation to carbon dioxide. So nitrous oxide is very potent. However, um, we do not release nearly as much nitrous oxide into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide or as methane. So that's why we talk about it a lot less. Okay, if that's not clear, just let me know and I'll try to explain that a little bit better to all of you. All right, so then let's just talk a little bit to wrap all of this up for this week about human induced climate change. So we've talked a lot about sort of the natural processes that um, are um, keeping our earth warm, keeping it at the climate it needs to be. Um, and I've stated pretty adamantly, we know that human behavior is enhancing this effect. Um, this next few slides are how we're enhancing it. So we have an imbalance in carbon dioxide levels in both our atmosphere and our ocean. 
we are releasing carbon so quickly that our natural processes of the environment that are naturally there to try to capture carbon and store carbon through the natural carbon cycle cannot keep up with the rate at which we're releasing carbon. So we are imbalancing the carbon cycle essentially um, and that imbalance is mostly happening in our atmosphere and in our water systems, our ocean particularly. Um, additionally, as we cut down our forests, we are removing one of the most major ways in which the carbon cycle has to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. So we are putting too much into the atmosphere to begin with, and then we are cutting down one of the major systems that our environment has to try to remove carbon from the atmosphere. This figure that we see right here, um, this graph on this slide is popularly referred to as the hockey stick graph. It shows the drastic nature of recent climate change and the rapid change in mean global temperature since the mid 1800s. Um, it can, shows you that the industrial revolution has happened. Um, in the mid 1800s and from there we saw a drastic increase in global temperatures and if you chart that against the increase in carbon dioxide it almost completely parallel follows the same um, the same general trend and this is one of the reasons why scientists are con, um, in agreement that we've altered our atmosphere through human behaviors and we're through human behaviors increasing the average temperature of the Earth's surface. Here you can see some of the most common greenhouse gases and how they have trended over the last um, 30 or so years, 50 years. The rise of greenhouse gases are believed to be responsible for most of the increase in global average temperatures for the last 50 years. At present, approximately 99% of 100-year global warming potential for all new emissions can be ascribed to carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Those are the three uh, greenhouse gases that are, um, are causing 99% of our increase in, hu um, in temperatures. So how are we doing this as humans? Well, we talked last module about how we have an exploding population that is dependent um, and what we haven't talked about yet is that we are dependent on fossil fuels. So we are adding more and more people to this earth and using more and more fossil fuels as our one of our primary sources of energy. When we use fossil fuels, we burn carbon essentially that has been stored and sequestered in the earth. We burn um, natural gas, we burn oil, we burn coal, all of these things have carbon in them. We then, when we burn them, we release that carbon into our atmosphere um, and that is the number one driver right now. We burn carbon to operate our planes, our cars, our trains, we burn carbon to generate our electricity and our power, and we burn carbon from um, bulk of our industrial processes as well. Every time we burn fossil fuels, we release all of that sequestered carbon into the atmosphere. So here is just one example. Um, this is electricity generation. This is a really simplified version of how we generate electricity. Basically what you do to generate electricity is you create steam. You take a bunch of water and you heat it up and you turn that water into vapor that vapor then in turn turns turbines and those turbines then generate the electricity that we need. Um, we can heat our water um, into water vapor through the sun, we can do it through um, the wind, but what we do a lot of in the United States is burn coal and natural gas to heat that water vapor. So we are highly dependent on fossil fuels to generate our electricity. In fact, 42% of all the electricity in the United States comes from coal, 21% comes from natural gas. So we are using fossil fuels to generate 63% of the electricity that we use in the United States. 
nuclear energy is almost a quarter of our energy, and we will look at that next week. Um, globally, more than almost half of all carbon dioxide emissions comes from burning coal alone. If you want to look at this more as a sector by sector basis, you can see that 21% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from power stations, from electricity, um, industrial processes like manufacturing, um, transportation, agriculture, just getting the fossil fuels out of the ground, heating and cooling our homes and doing the activities we do in our homes, disposing of our waste. You can see all there how um, all of these behaviors produce greenhouse gases. Um, and that is um, because of the electricity primarily that's needed um, in those places. So um, that is a quick overview of human behaviors that are contributing to greenhouse gases. Uh, if you have any questions about greenhouse gases, global warming potential, um, uh, just shoot me an email or do a Google search. There's lots of really good information out there for you. Thank you.